Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I was going to ask for your feedback here, but I remembered you're not allowed to talk because you're sitting in the pews without your masks on. So uh, this is a rhetorical question, but I think you know the answer. Uh, I've always heard there are two things you're not supposed to talk about at a party. Politics and religion, right? So we thought, you know what would be fun? is if we talk politics at church. Seemed like a pretty good idea. So here we are talking about politics in church. And, you know, our country has a long history of blending politics and religion. In fact, I would go so far as to say that politics in America today is religion. Politics in America today is religion. We've been blending these two topics for a long, long time, but this idea didn't start here in the United States. This actually has its roots in ancient times. All the way back in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, and I will make of you a great nation. God promised Abraham that he was going to turn his descendants into a great political nation. And that promise came to fruition during their time in slavery. God multiplied them into a great host, and then he brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. And he said in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, God's people were led by God into a a, a land that they could call their own. And and they looked around at the nations around them, and they noticed that these other nations had kings. And this sounded pretty good to the people of God. And so they came to Samuel one day, and they said, Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Well, Samuel, Samuel didn't think that was a very good idea. But he brought it to God, and God said, you're right, that's a terrible idea, right? But do their will in this matter. But first, I want you to warn them about what it means to have a king ruling over them instead of me. The king is going to tax them. The king is going to send their people, their sons, off to war. He's going to demand their homage. And so Samuel dutifully warned the people, and they said, We don't care. We want a king. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And so God gave them kings, and by and large, the kings were wicked. And they led God's people away and until such time that God caused foreign nations to rise up and destroy the nation of Israel until they had no nation of their own. Well, this was the case when Jesus came, finally. Rome is in power, and and they're occupying Israel. And a lot of people thought, well, you know, maybe this Messiah is going to come, and he's going to give us back a a nation of our own again. And so they thought, well, maybe Jesus is that guy. And in fact, even the disciples who walked with Jesus for three years, who spent the most time with Jesus, even they were confused about this. Because we we know in Acts, Jesus appears to the disciples in Acts 1 after he's been resurrected. And they say to him in Acts 1 verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Have you finally come to restore the kingdom to Israel? They misunderstood why Jesus had come. Jesus hadn't come to restore an earthly kingdom to the nation of Israel. But he had come to establish a heavenly kingdom on earth. In our gospel reading today, Pastor read it for us in Mark. The Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. They didn't like Jesus, uh, and so they laid a trap for him. And they said, you know what, let's ask him about taxes. Because he's either going to say, pay your taxes to Rome, or, you know, and then put God in second chair... Or he's going to say, don't pay your taxes, listen to God, and, and well, Rome's not going to be happy, and they're going to take care of this Jesus fellow. So they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Who, by the way, thinks he's descended from a god? And Jesus, as he's wont to do, sniffs out the trap. And he says, you know what? Let me see a coin. So they bring him a coin, and he, he holds it up, and he says, whose image is on this coin? Whose imprint is this? And they said, Caesar's. Yes, 
Caesar's. And so Jesus says to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And with this simple answer, Jesus confounded the Pharisees, and he revealed his purpose on this earth to form a heavenly kingdom and to give us dual citizenship status in a heavenly kingdom and an earthly kingdom. Now, God rules over both of these kingdoms. God is sovereign in both kingdoms, but he rules in different ways. So let's talk about the earthly kingdom first. In the earthly kingdom, God rules through government. And so Paul, when he's writing to the church in Rome, he says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul told the church in Rome to obey the authorities, the same authorities that are throwing Christians in prison and putting them in the Colosseum to get attacked by wild animals. Paul says, obey your authorities. Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. Be good citizens of the earthly kingdom in which you have been placed. And he would say the same thing to us today to be good citizens of this earthly kingdom that we call the United States of America. He says, be good citizens. Obey the laws of your local, state, and national leaders. He says, pray for your leaders, whether whether you agree with them or not. Pay your taxes. And yes, participate in the political process of the country in which you live. He says, be good citizens of your earthly kingdom. But Jesus came to establish a heavenly kingdom. And he does that. He reigns in that heavenly kingdom through his church. And when we use that word church, we don't mean a local congregation. He doesn't rule through First Trinity Lutheran Church. He doesn't rule through a national church body, in our case, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. He doesn't rule through an international church church body, but through the capital C church. It's the church that we confess in our creeds every week. I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I believe in one holy Christian church. And that church, that capital C church is found wherever God's word is preached and the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's supper are given faithfully to his people. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. God, through his word, when it is read and preached and taught, is creating and recreating his church on earth constantly. But he also does something unique and mysterious and special when he combines his word with water. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In baptism, God's word joined with water brings us into a new heavenly kingdom and gives us dual citizenship status. God brings us into that heavenly kingdom and he he places his image upon our heart. If you look at the coins in the Roman Empire, they had Caesar's image. If you look at our coins today in America, they have leaders from our past. But if you were to look at your heart, it bears the image of Christ. God has put his imprint, his son Jesus on our hearts and made us citizens of a heavenly kingdom. This is why Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. We have a long history of mixing uh, politics and religion in America to the point where I would say that politics in America today is religion. And if you've uh, read your Bible a lot, you may notice when politicians speak that they often will make allusions to God's word or, or other secular writers, they, they might, might make indirect reference to God's word. 
And a somewhat famous example of this, I think, in our day is, uh, well, most of our days, not some of the younger people's days, but uh, most of our days, you may remember President Ronald Reagan in the 80s, right? And uh, Reagan, in his farewell speech, compared America to a shining city on a hill. He said, America is the shining city on a hill. It was an allusion to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and following, where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. We mix politics and religion all the time, and our leaders do this. And so Reagan said that America is the shining city on a hill. It's the city that shines forth peace and justice and liberty and democracy into a dark world. And we confuse these two things, politics and religion. But Jesus continues in Matthew 5, in verse 16, he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, if you've been at First Trinity for a while, you may recognize these words. We use them in our baptismal liturgy. Pastor baptizes the baby. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Sue Steggy takes one of these little baptismal candles, right? And she walks up here to the candle and she lights it from the candle that's on the altar. Maybe. There it goes. And she comes down and she says to the baby, May your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We use this in our baptismal liturgy because Jesus was not speaking to a political nation in this reading in Matthew 5. He's not speaking to an earthly kingdom. He's speaking to the citizens of his heavenly kingdom. He's speaking to the church. The church is the city on the hill, the lamp on the stand that shines forth so that people might give glory to their Father who is in heaven. And he comes to us this day, and he says, Ben, may your light so shine before others that they would see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jenna, may your light so shine before others that they would see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Roger, may your light so shine before others that they would see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus comes to us, his church, and he says, may your light so shine that they would see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. God has brought us into this heavenly kingdom, but at the same time, we live in an earthly kingdom. When I look at our earthly kingdom, there's this huge division in our country today. And on the surface, it appears as if the division is between the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, and there's, there's all these other minor parties out there who probably dislike both of those major parties. Right? There's this, this tension and this conflict and this division around politics between left and right, Democrats and Republicans. But I would propose that the real division in our country today comes from misunderstanding our citizenship, our dual citizenship, and improperly blending the heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom, and confusing which takes precedence and priority in our lives. So how do we, as the church, God's heavenly kingdom on earth, preach messages of peace in a country racked by division. Well, it starts by remembering who and whose you are. Remember who and whose you are. Paul says in Galatians 3, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, and you are, 
then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul says that if you are Christ, and you are, then you are Abraham's offspring, Abraham, who God promised to turn into a great nation, but not just an earthly kingdom, not just a political nation, for it was through Abraham's offspring that a Savior would come, Jesus, who would die and rise again to establish a heavenly kingdom and give us citizenship in that heavenly kingdom. You are Christ, and therefore you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. And if you are finding your identity in a political party, you are worshiping a false god, because make no mistake, politics in America today is religion. They demand your allegiance, and they demand your devotion, and yes, they demand your worship, and that you agree with their doctrines, which they call platforms. If you find your identity in a political party, you are worshiping a false god. That is not who you are. Remember who and whose you are. You are in Christ. Therefore, you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. The last time our country was this divided, uh, I hear people say is, is probably during the Civil War when North and South were fighting over the issue of slavery. And Lincoln was president then, and Lincoln wrote in his uh, uh, personal notes about that time, he says, in the present Civil War, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. Truer words have not been spoken by a politician for our time today. It is quite possible, and indeed is, that the purposes of the political parties today are different than the purposes that God has for his people. Remember who and whose you are. You belong to Christ. You are his. You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And as Christ's people, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom first, he calls us to live as an ambassador in this earthly kingdom, in the world. We are ambassadors from a heavenly kingdom. An ambassador is someone who goes from one nation to another to live there, but speaks for their home country. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We are to be ambassadors from the heavenly kingdom into the earthly kingdom to speak words of peace and reconciliation, to draw people back to God, to be reconciled to God, to be at peace with God for the sake of Christ Jesus. We are ambassadors from the heavenly kingdom to the earthly kingdom. And one of the chief ways that we do that is by loving others like Jesus did. We love others like Jesus did. Jesus told his disciples to love one another as I have loved you. And Paul, when he's writing to that church in Rome, he says, obey the government, pay your taxes, do, do what they command. And at the end of that, he says, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Paul says, if you want to fulfill the law of Christ, love others like Jesus did. So that means that we take up the cause of the refugee. It means that we speak for the unborn. It means that we fight for racial justice and equality, for the right to gather together and worship safely, to care for the sick, the poor, the destitute, the least of these, and dare I say, to forgive and not cancel. You will never feel at home in a political party because that is not your home. That is not who you are. You are citizens of a heavenly kingdom first and foremost. And you might look at that list of things, the ways that we love others, and you say, 
that belongs to this political party and that's this political party and that's this one and that one and this one and that one. And you might realize that quite possibly and indeed it is true that the purposes of the political parties today are not the same as the purpose that God has for his people. So remember who you are and whose you are and live as ambassadors in this world loving others as Jesus did. Because our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. If we have been baptized in Christ, we have put on Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, Democrat nor Republican, nor Green nor Libertarian, nor Independent, nor whatever party you want to put in there, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, and you are, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people of God's own treasured possession. And we await a Savior to come from heaven and take us to the shining city on the hill, Zion, New Jerusalem, for we have no lasting city here, but we seek the city that is to come. God grant that you would live as ambassadors, loving, other, loving others as Jesus did, and never, ever forget who and whose you are. You are Christ's, and in his name we pray. Amen.